There he is. John, I think uh, we're live already. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> like a bad dream, I'm back. <laughs> uh, let's see here. What can we do to fix you up? I'm sorry that we uh, got off to a little bit of a premature start right here. Uh, let me fix you up. Uh, uh, and... Hi guys, and welcome to the team house. <laughs> Hi, Dave. How the hell are you? Long time no see. John, it's been forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're having just a couple of technical issues, as usual. That's uh, what happens when you get two grunts running the uh, tech stuff. Uh, we're live right now, John, just so you know. Um, uh, Pretty scary, man. You know that picture, if you take, if you, if you take a freeze frame of that shot, you put it in your garage, you got a one-year guarantee. Your All garage right. will be rodent-free. <laughs> here we are. This is episode 61 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park. And our guest tonight is John Stryker Mayer, old friend. And he was a 1-0, which is a team leader in MACV SOG on RT Idaho, Re Recon Team Idaho. Uh, MACV SOG, of course, was Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group. They did some of the most dangerous operations of the war deep behind enemy lines. They were clandestine uh, cross-border operations into Laos, Cambodia, and North Vietnam. And John was one of those guys uh, back, what, 68 to 70, John? Right. Yeah, April 68, April 69, and then October 69 to April 70. Oh, there's no sound. What's going on here? Some people are saying they have sound. Some people are saying they don't. I can hear you fly by. Uh, there's only one person saying no sound. No, there's a whole bunch of people. Some people are saying they have it. Some people are saying no, they don't. No, I think it's all uh, Storm Games okay. saying no sound. Yeah, some people are saying that they got to reset their browsers. Yeah, geez, I'm sorry for the technical issues today, everyone. I'm, I'm not uh, sure why things happened a little bit differently than they normally do. Um, but thank you, everyone, for chiming in and letting me know. John, I apologize again. Um, John Don't is worry. also the author of Across the Fence, On the Ground, and Sog Chronicles. I have one of his books right here from him. Uh, they are all worth checking out. Across the Fence is uh, John's memoir about his own personal experiences in Mac V. Saad. Terrific, terrific book. One of my favorite Vietnam memoirs. And John, thank you again. We're so lucky to have you here today. My pleasure, Jack. And uh, it's always good to be around some fellow combat vets. We can talk to talk a little bit better. <laughs> um, John, I think the way we usually kick off the show, the way we usually start it, well, in addition to the technical difficulties and ironing everything out, <laughs> is uh, asking where you came from, uh, how did you get your start, and we want to know your origin story, and I think maybe you can start off by telling us about where you grew up and how you got your nickname and eventually <laughs> ending up in the military. Well, you know, it's, it all began in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, Dad was a milkman. Mom was the choir director, and Dad saw this pretty lady playing the organ, joined the choir, and uh, before we knew it, they're married. I was the first of uh, four kids, three of which survived, and uh, I grew up in a milk truck in Trenton. And um, after graduating from high school, um, took me two years to flunk out of college. After I flunked out of college, <laughs> uh, I was working in Yosemite National, National Park, and uh, um, my dad said, hey, you flunked out, get ready for the draft work. We had the draft back then. And um, I read the book, The Green Berets by Robin Moore. I said, that's it. If I'm going to war, I want to go with these guys. They sound crazy. And uh, um, went through, I went down and listed. And um, the rest is history. Went through, uh, got in, basic, uh, jump, basic advanced infantry, jump school. And during advanced infantry, Back then, you could volunteer for special forces, and they give you the battery test, and the recruitment sergeant at the end of it all goes, I'm the last one. <laughs> he goes, Meyer, you're lucky. We lowered the standards. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
What what and led so you from there? We went went through the pro programs, and then we had some TDY on RTT before we went to Nam, and then um, went to Nam. Had the in country training afterwards. They said there's a project looking for volunteers, and me and Johnny McIntyre and so many other guys, we all signed up. Welcome to McAfee Sog. And of course, you, you you're familiar with the story from across the fence where we flew into FOB one, get off the helicopter. And Spike Team Idaho, in 68, we were called Spike Teams. And Idaho got on, disappeared, never to be heard from again. And so there, there was two Americans, Glenn Lane and Robert Owen, are amongst the 50-plus uh, Green Berets that are still missing in action in Laos today. So there was an instant opening in recon. Spider Parks was there. Spider and I had gone through training group together, and he became my one zero. And we had to hire some more Vietnamese. Trained for a month, dealt with the monsoons, and then we started running missions in August of '68. John, can you explain that a little bit? Like in in that Spike Team Idaho just like disappeared. I mean, there were side teams that inserted and never made their first comms window, right? I mean, just like disappeared into the ether. Uh, can you say that again, Jack? I, I was just what? asking if you could explain a little bit about. SOG teams like Spike Team Idaho that just disappeared into the ether. Like there were some that inserted and never made their first comms window, if I recall correctly. Correct. Um, usually most made the first combo, but in 68, by May of 68, which this was, it was like around May 22nd, 23rd, um, Idaho went in to give a team okay and they were never heard from again. And the bright light went in two days later. And uh, George Sternberg, Mike Tucker, and uh, Perry, Mike Perry went in. And um, they ran, They made instant contact with the NVA. The NVA had uh, CAR 15s and they had M26 frag grenades, one of which blew off the boots of George Sternberg. And so everybody was wounded, some critically, and they had one team member that was KIA on that. And they left him in the bomb crater. And um, now, at that point, Idaho was the sixth or seventh team that had been wiped out in 68 already. And so sometimes the team would be on the ground. Um, and in Idaho's case, apparently, they got hit pretty quick. And then we had a team like Alabama where everybody's wiped out except the one zero. John Allen escaped and Ian Eat for three days. And then um, they saw him in the ash hall. Somebody was able to see his panel and pick them up. So there's a team that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it was wiped out. Save, the saving grace was that John survived. So 68 was a pretty ugly year. And that was only May. <laughs> and, and that was the opening onto which you walked onto a recon team. Yes, sir. Welcome to the Secret War. It, what, what, did you, what did you know about SOG at that time that, you, you know, you're walking in there? I mean, it, it was super classified at the time. I, I don't think John Q. Public knew about it until, what, the 1990s. I mean, what, what did you know as, as a young Green Beret? Nothing. I'm dumb as I look. You know, we went in there, you, you volunteer for the project, and then... You know, the funny part was after 16 months of training, Jack, you know how you, you break your pad out, you got your pencils or pen. So here we are at the briefing. We all break our pads and pencils out, and we're sitting there going, okay, let's go. The Sergeant Mears would put that shit away. This is a <sighs> top secret briefing. Whoa, that got our undivided attention right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we never looked back. We yeah. went through the briefing, and he told everybody, if you don't want to, now's the time to leave. But nobody left. And so uh, we hung in there, went through the, uh, went through the process, got the briefing, and the next day we flew up to um, FOB one, and that's when we had that little exchange where we lost Lane and Spike Team Idaho. Did they? How much information? Uh, uh, I mean, obviously it was a classified project. How much information did they give you at the briefing? And and did they did they give you an indication of? Uh, like obviously in Vietnam, everything was a risk, but the higher level of risk that it, it entailed. Well, they told us it it was high risk, but you know, when you're as green as we were, right. we're greener than grass. Right. Who knows? The and the, and the fun thing that 
we've heard from other people was when they they give you the briefing, the sergeant major after you sign the documents, he pulls the map down, and there on the map is there's South Vietnam, and all it has is the cities. Then across the fence in Laos and Cambodia, there's target boxes, ten by ten by ten, and that would that was each target, some more deadly than others, and. Um, that gave you a sense of what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And it was really um, an eye opener. And again, don't talk about it. And um, that's the way it was. I mean, we had teams that would do almost identical missions, but unless the team members at the pub talked about, they would never know. Yeah. And we had that happen a couple of times. And and in fact, Jack, the, the book with a picture on it, we were going to go into a mission at the Mugia Pass, and that's what we're getting inspected for by General uh, Stilwell. He was the uh, commander for I Corps, which mm-hmm. Vietnam was divided in four corps, I being northernmost. So we were getting ready to go into Laos, northern Laos. At the reunion about 10 years ago, <laughs> some guy looks at the book and goes, hey, I remember that mission. You guys were out there taking pictures, and I was making fun of you guys. And baby son, you know, and uh, he said, what was that mission about? So I told him, he goes, you're kidding. He said, they came to our team. They told us to do it. We told him it was a suicide mission. We said, hell no, we ain't going. <laughs> <laughs> so they shopped it around until they found some guys who uh, were willing to take it on. They found the knucklehead. Yeah, me. <laughs> John, what was, I, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor it too much because I think this audience it, it has some familiarity, but could you talk a little bit about the, the various missions that SOG had because it wasn't just recon. Right. Um, well, and the reason why we had the secret wars is because our government had agreed to not have combat troops in Laos or Cambodia. And there was, a, there was an, some kind of an accord reached on it. And the North Vietnamese, being the honorable communist dogs that they were, had the same agreement. But by 1968, there were 25 to 35,000 NBA in Laos alone, plus the indigenous folks that had to cooperate with them, work on the trails, keep them open. If they heard helicopters, they had to report the helicopters and where they landed. And uh, same thing was true in Cambodia, where... By 69, they had 100,000 troops, and we, we weren't allowed to have anybody there. So our hands are tied. So our job was to go in, A, find them, see what they're up to, do wiretaps, POW snatches, because as you know, the best source for intel is a live POW. They can tell you what's what. I mean, it may take a little extra convincing to have them talk to you, but... Uh, um, and, you know, they were dedicated. We, we had one of our guys, in fact, it was the troll. They had picked up two POWs, got them into the helicopter, and they were checking, checking them for weapons and hand grenades. Well, it turned out that one of the uh, POWs they had picked up was a woman. Well, they were shocked. And they, now, remember, they're in the H-34, which had a longer passenger compartment to it than a UE. And they were in the back of the helicopter with her. When they saw it was a woman, they were like, oh, my God. And there was like momentary pause, but they let go of her. She turned around, ran, and jumped right out the door. Holy fuck. Oh, yeah. These were, they were serious about the mission. And that, that's. The, these were NVA, I take it. Say again? The NVA. Yes, North yeah, Vietnamese hard. Army, the other vectors that came down from the yeah. south through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah, hardcore. Yeah, and that was the way they bring the supplies down. And our job was also to monitor that. And sometimes the, uh, we had teams down in the Khantoum that would put in roadblocks, and then they'd back it up. The Air Force would come in and knock a bunch of them out, uh, the trucks and transport, just to, to uh, interdict. But uh, never-ending battle. Uh I wanted to ask you about the what you had mentioned about the POW snatches because you and um, 
it was Lynn Black, right? You developed a kind of like ingenious <laughs> method to uh, snatch a POW off the Ho Chi Minh Trail or an enemy POW, EPW, I guess Indeed. I should say. Well, the key thing, uh, the, the, the key thing that we were debating and trying to refine was like with how do you have a kill zone with claymores and you get one person alive? Right. So the theory was have a hunk of C4 in the dead center of the kill zone. And then the claymores would fan out so that there would be four or five foot section in that kill zone where the the ball bearings from the claymores would not kill them. But the question was, how big of a piece of C4? Is it a two inches, four inches? <laughs> So Lynn, I, I can't take credit for this. We talked about the concept, but good old Lynn Black, Lynn Maurice Black Jr., <laughs> he worked on this, and he well blown it up. So one day he did it. He put the certain I forget what the amount was now. It's too long ago, but a certain amount of C4, put it down at six feet away because that's what we planned. Everything was at six feet in the jungle, and he blew it, knocked himself out. <laughs> it worked perfect. So he came back to base going, hey, I figured it out. His hair was all blown out of place. <laughs> and he was talking really loud because he couldn't hear a damn thing. He had damaged his hearing. <laughs> he used himself as the test subject for this? Say again? Did he use himself as the test subject for this? He did. He blew himself up, literally. <laughs> and so he was so proud of the fact that he figured it out, and it, it worked. I mean, it was a really good tactic. And so... Um, with that improvement and with that cut of C4, we practiced as, uh, you know, setting up, establishing the ambush, and tearing it down quickly. And uh, because you know, November, we had a perfect ambush set up, just like that. Had everything set up with the C4, and then, of course, we got socked in. We had to pull back, and we were on the ground for five days and five nights with them hunting for us with dogs and everything else. And and did you have the opportunity to use that technique? I did not. Other teams did, and it worked. Really? Yes. Yeah, it's was, it was funny because we had the ambush set up twice. The first time, we had to pull it down because we got socked in. You know, I, we were we had been on the ground maybe three or four hours, mm -hmm. had the thing set up, and we had moved far off of the LZ. We... Um, Normally, we would move 10 and 10. We would move 10 minutes, wait 10 minutes, blah, blah, blah. Here, I didn't want to wait. I just went, we went straight up this hill for almost an hour, wore the guys out. We got to a big trail, crossed it, got to the other side, put up the ambush, and it was beautiful. It was a perfect insertion. And uh, when Spider came back for a combo check, I gave him the code, hey, we'll have a POW for us. So with that code, he would then call the assets we would blow it and then meet everybody at the LC with a, with a live POW. So I gave him the code, and Spider goes, ah, don't breathe, don't fart, don't do anything. I'm at 10,000 feet. I can't see the mountain you're on, let alone find you an LZ. And that was the beginning of a long night, and they came after us with dogs and everything else. And the other time, we were in Cambodia, and uh, we had a perfect damn bush set up, and they pulled us out because of a... Uh, of a political thing with the prince Simon. complaining, yeah. Well, but over, over Willie Pete, right? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so weird. I mean, like you're in the middle of a war. You're doing a technically illegal cross border operation. Well, yeah. I mean, to top it off, I mean the mission. That mission, our six man recon team mission was to go find three. NVA divisions, 10,000 each, the first, the third, and the seventh NVA divisions. So, hey, we went, we found them. We barely got out of there alive. And we used the five second uh, fuse on our claymores as we E&E'd back to the uh, primary LZ. And had it not been for those claymores and a quick response on assets, we'd be Cambodian fertilizer today. Yeah. And yeah, we were pissed. When we left, we gave them a little souvenir, a little white phosphorus. <laughs> <laughs> And they filed a, a formal complaint with the U.S. government. They weren't concerned about the 50,000 NVA. No problem there. But that damn Willie Pete pissed them off. <laughs> and that, that would have put me over the top, too. That, that's, just, that's just too much there, John. I agree. 
I was highly disturbed, Jack. But, and again, I was only an E4. I didn't have a clout in that world. Uh, some of the, the other missions that SOG had, I want to talk about Eldest Son and the um, the wiretapping, the induction cables. That, that stuff's really interesting, I think. Yeah, well, the wiretaps were, uh, were interesting because, the uh, again, this is uh, 1968. And we had a, they gave us a cassette player. And we had a cassette. And I think we maybe even had a highly advanced 90 minute cassette. And what the CIA told us was, and we had from that cassette, we had a wire that we trained our little people, our South Vietnamese, to climb up the telephone poles or a tree, climb up, tap into the wire, come back down. They covered a the wire with mud. Mm -hmm. So anybody walking past it wouldn't see it. And then we turned on the tape recorder right away. We wouldn't wait, whether we heard somebody or not, because the CIA said, if you record, bring it back, we'll amplify it 100 times, because the NVA telephone lines were open all the time, whether in the cradle mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Like the American phone, it goes off. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did that a few times. And then the uh, POW snatch, well, you heard about those. And then for the eldest son... That was where we carried ammo that was rigged to explode, and it was enemy ammo. So it would be round 7.62 for the AK-47s and the SKS, as well as the 82-millimeter um, uh, mortar rounds. And we would carry those on a mission. Now, sometimes, like on November 30th, there was a specific mission where they had a, a team of volunteers that went together seven Americans in a King Bee flew towards Laos and the mission was to put in a whole load of Elder Sun because they found a cache they were going to go in and mix the stuff in and put some more around well that helicopter got blown out of the sky and we lost seven SF guys plus the entire helicopter crew that day on an Elder Sun mission ordinarily on our missions we would always carry at least at minimum the AK-47 rounds. And then we go along the trail, maybe drop a couple, find a trail. We, we wouldn't walk on a trail. If you crossed it, go up and down, leave a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or if we ever found an enemy cache, stick it in there. And that was the long and short. And we heard amazing reports back. And later, years later, we saw photos on people that had used the rounds to their detriment. John, when you talk yes, about uh, like the sorry the the POW or the the um, you know the extraction technique that you developed and that other teams use it successfully, what was training like and how much you said that you didn't really share missions, but how did the teams interact when it came to you know TTPs when it came to and how did your training in SF or AIT you know the advanced infantry and then SF differ from what you learned on the ground with, you know, with the MACV SOG teams and, and, you know, and then how did you guys spread that information? Well, one of the key things we had was that we always talked in the club afterwards. So anytime a team would come back from a mission, we would talk about any of the tactics they ran into. And that would be the, for us, um, that was the prime source of learning in, in the middle of 68 because there had been a training, they had a, a training academy set up at, at, not an academy, but there was a training facility at Camp Duck. Camp Duck got overrun in early May of 68. So when we landed in 68, it shut down and uh, we were on our own. Plus we had senior NCOs who had been there for a while. We would talk to them. And, you know, one of the things was hard, it was always hard to find LZs. So we pioneered this whole rope extraction. And again, it was refined. In the very beginning, it would just be a rope. Then they put a rope with a sandbag and a D-ring on it. And uh, then our guys would just have a Swiss seat. And then by the end of 68, they had a McGuire seat that was a like a big piece of leather or cloth that had a couple hooks in it. And it was something you could jump into and hook into a little bit more quickly, but, but it wasn't really stable. And then by 69, they had what they called a stable rig that the 
the straps were tied right into your web gear so that if you wanted to get extracted by ropes, you would let the, stra let the straps down, you could hook them right in, and you're ready to go quick. Uh, whereas our way, we had the Swiss seat. You had to put a Swiss seat on, which was a six-foot piece of rope. Uh, you don't know if you're familiar with that or not for repelling purposes. Yeah. So it goes around, you know, so you know about that. So put the D-ring in, then the rope, try to get it down, hook in, and then take off. And, of course, as you know too well, as you're getting extracted, the amount of gunfire, sometimes the helicopter pilots wouldn't pull you all the way out. Mm -hmm. You would turn into a human pinball, you're, and you're getting ricocheted off the trees as you're getting extracted. Well, that, that happened to you once, John, right? You got drugged through the trees and lost a lot of your equipment? Well, yeah. First, I, I got drugged through the trees, and the reason why um, this was a, we had difficulty finding LZs. We came up with a new tactic of saying, "Let's try a daisy cutter in the middle of the jungle." So Covey went out. The first day, they found a jungle with no trails. They dropped a two thousand pound bomb, and I'm starting. I'm getting ready to repel. Well, all of a sudden, there's secondary explosions. On that day, we had over twenty secondary explosions and to this day ho chi Minh's trying to figure out how the hell those green berets find out about our cachet well the next day i repelled in halfway down the rope i hear them talking back and forth so i'm on the ground for a little bit just light fire m79 but obviously we're compromised so i canceled the mission they came back they pulled me out and when i'm getting pulled out they opened fire on me with an ak so I'm firing at them, and I forget I failed to hook up my D-ring. So that's that's the old story where we finally get out. I got drugged through the trees a little bit. So once we get some altitude, I'm holding a rope, and my arms were cut up pretty bad in the crook of the arms. And I was changing, hit an air pocket, turned me upside down, and then the Swiss seat went down on my knees. <laughs> so I'm, I'm signaling, get down, get down. Then all my gear came down on my throat, was choking me, and then it went down on my feet. So I'm this, you know, I'm there like a New York City hooker, my legs spread wide, <laughs> holding the seat on, and I passed out. And uh, when I passed out, luckily Captain Tuong, the King Bee pilot, had lowered the helicopter. So I only fell about 10, 15 feet. Henry King came out, took off all my gear including my SOG knife and my CAR-15, which is still in Laos. But he threw me in the helicopter. Holy shit. So that's where I lost. Oh, yeah, S-4 was not a happy camper that day. Yeah, you talk in your book about the the um, the major, the S-3 major, uh, that you guys were not too fond of, and said that uh, he was not... Uh, well, not only was he not well liked, but the fact that he still had a thick German accent didn't help either. <laughs> right, he's the only man to ever call me a coward. On top of it, but really, he just, he just died recently, so uh, that's the uh, footnote for him. But he's gone. Was but, uh, yeah, he? He has uh, some bad experience with him. Was Was he one of the Lodjack guys? Yes. Yeah. And most of those guys were tremendous troops. Yeah. Yeah. And he. To his credit, I hate to say this, but to his credit, when he was down at Contoon, I'm told he had done some good things down there in recon. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that personally, but just to try to be a little bit fair and right, semi-bound, right, right. I hated his balls because he did some, some really nasty. Like, you know, we were running targets. They just wanted to get a team on the ground. We come in in the morning, get a briefing, get shot out of primary, secondary, the alternate, come back, eat lunch. Here's a new target. No intel report. Just get on the ground. Right. And that was him. Right. They wanted to get people on the ground. It's like, okay, that's the other side of the secret war, you know. But uh, like I said, just an E-4 or 1-0. You know, and, and some of the the accidents and misgivings aside, I, I do want to point out, like, you, I think you guys and the, the LERP teams, between the two of you, you guys were like the tactical gods out there as far as I'm concerned. Like, you really had to have all of your shit dialed in because you're a small team on the ground behind enemy lines. These guys did not have any of the uh, the air cover, the kind of air cover that we have today. You didn't have the kind of technology that we have today. Um, 
there are no predator drones and, and all this ISR. And I think that's a big reason why we had to put teams on the ground, why we needed guys out there on the ground gathering reconnaissance. Uh, between that and it being a jungle environment as opposed to, you know, desert like the, the war Dave and I served in. Yeah. Well, um, I, I agree with everything you said except for the air assets. We had SPADs. You had the A-10. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked to have had the A-10. But those SPADs could stay on station long. They had more ordnance. And, yes, sometimes it would be difficult making contact in triple canopy with the air assets. Mm -hmm. So that was the first part of the challenge. But once we made it, uh, when we declared a prairie fire emergency, we would have everything from gunships, SPADs, fast movers. And then at night, uh, you know, one mission, we went through four Spectres, and the, uh, the wow. uh, C-130s. Right. And they brought it within 25 feet closer. And we, you know, that's <laughs> But they came at us. There was, there, was, there was hundreds of them that night, maybe over, well, probably a thousand. I, didn't, I was too busy to count, Jack. <laughs> a lot of them. And we, like I said, we went through four, three or four specters at one night. Well, where was so we it had that, good air assets. Where, where was it you were denied air, though? Was it in Cambodia? Correct. Uh, in Cambodia, all we were allowed was to have uh, helicopter gunships. Mm -hmm. No spads, no fast movers. And... Um, we had a couple teams, and once it got into a real world of shit, uh, they may have had Spectre for a little while, and then the Spads came over. But they were really close to the border. And again, sometimes the border would move. We'd have a border that would move when the team was really in deep It trouble. happens, man. It happens. Yeah, yeah. You had to, I mean, how hard can you tell the border, like in, in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan? Who's keeping track, border. even? <laughs> what are, what are, you, the, the, are you the National Geographic Society over there, John? I don't, I don't know where that border is. Yeah, right. What, what border? I don't see no stinking border. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if I can get some air assets in here. Yeah. What when you when you go dry on, on four gunships? What is that like for you personally when you get back to base? I mean, was that like oh that was a hell of a t thing, or it's like okay whatever on to the next one? Oh, well, that was like um, just another day in SOG. Thank God we're alive. Thanks to Spectre. Because we were up all night. They kept coming at us, but they didn't know where we were. So we were playing hide-and-go-seek. And, go seek. and uh, about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, as we went through the fourth Spectre, the clouds began to move in. And we lost contact. We lost visual with them. And so they came at us harder. So... We would throw a hand grenade. You'd hear them coming. we throw a hand grenade. they scurry away. Then they would come back. Well, we were getting low on hand grenades. So Sal and Chow went out and found rocks. And so we would throw rocks. And you hear them scurry away. And then you waited a while. Cause my little people could see them. Now, I couldn't see them. But Sal, he, he, he could smell those folks. Anyways, this is the way it went for a couple of hours. And then we throw a real hand grenade, and you hear him dragging the bodies away. Mm -hmm. And we even threw a really peat because we were getting that low. And uh, nobody filed a complaint on that one, Jack. But Thank we God. were out there all night, and then finally came in the morning, they got us. We, when they pulled us out, we did extensive uh, air cover around the LZ, and they came in, and we went out with minimal gunfire. But there were buku blood trails. We lost a lot of people, and yet... We never heard them exclaim or anybody. If that had been me shot by Spectre, I would have been howling like a dog. But it's, uh, you know, those guys were amazing. You know, the, the, the interview we did last week with John Cronin, he was a Force Recon Marine. Um, where was he? he uh, Quatrang? I'm, I'm, I'd have to go back. I'm sorry. I can't remember exactly. Black Rifle Coffee Company, John? No, no. John Cronin. Prone, okay. Uh, he's a force recon guy, but he was telling us how when he was in recon, they uh, would get hit by the NVA, and there would be a huge firefight, but it was the spookiest damn thing because when dawn came in the morning, they had recovered all their dead already. There were no bodies, and it was almost like, you know, it had not happened. Uh, the firefight had not happened. He just said it was just the creepiest thing. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I was always amazed. I mean, um, and there was a couple of missions where we, we stacked up the bodies high. And uh, um, we were busy getting out. But uh, that mission in particular, it was daylight. And what we could see were blood trails, but no bodies again. Because we had, I told the guys to look for a body because, you know, if you see one, you want to get any maps or any intel that you could get off the dead, the dead soldier. You never know. Uh, on that note, I uh, also want to ask you about the incident where you were listening to the radio. And I can't remember if it was a wiretap or not, but when you no, were hearing was, uh, FM, when you were hearing Russian over the radio. Yes. Oh yeah, we were. Um, that was the same mission where we had the boot, uh, had the ambush set up, and the guy touched my boot that night. And then two nights later, when we were on the mountaintop, we were as bored, and we heard an aircraft. And so I'm scanning through the FM dial, came across the channel. They were talking in Russian, so we we put out calls on the emergency beeper and on our FM channel, trying to get some air assets. But this is like midnight one o'clock in the morning and jack it was the weirdest thing you know how dark it is in the jungle mm -hmm. and so we're on the mountaintop but still we had some canopy and when you look out i had i had fallen asleep so i forget if it was if it was bubba or henry king came up to me and goes you will not believe this and off in the distance they had lit up their lz with lights for the supply drop and it looked like Broadway. It was so bright. And it, it was out of our range. We had nothing we could shoot at him. But uh, that was strange. But yeah, that was November 68. So and you saw, you saw the Soviets bringing in a supply drop. Sure. And, you know, don't forget, at the end of 68, Johnson had uh, canceled bombing Hanoi. Mm -hmm. So all the anti-aircraft weaponry then came down to Ho Chi Minh Trail. I mean, they had it in 68. But they came down with the heavy stuff then. And besides the 12.7, the 23 Mike Mike, 37 Mike Mike, is it 57? And uh, later on with Operation Tailwind in uh, September of 70, they had ACAC. -AC. And, um, you know, it's like watching a movie from a World War II movie. You had the ACAC -AC shooting at the helicopters, the CH 53s that were taking the troops in, and then when they brought them out. And uh, we had a medic that's, that's, to this day, was startled by that. You know, it's like, fortunately, they missed. I know it's contentious in some circles, but, I mean, what was, I mean, based on your own experience and also, yeah. you know, what we know about MACV SOG today, what we know about the operations and what's been declassified, what was the situation with Russian advisors in Laos and North Vietnam in those days? Well, we know that they had over 3,000. They're also Cubans and they're Chinese there. Mm -hmm. And there's no question about it. Um, the Russians, we, we, we confirmed it there. And about now, about 12, 13 years ago, a YouTube came out that was a reporter in Russia who was attending the anniversary of Russians killed in the Russian secret war in Vietnam. So as part of his reporting, he reported that there were over 3,000 Russians had been there and that they had at least 12 or 13 KIAs. So I was really disappointed that we didn't have a higher number of KIAs, those commie dogs. But there, but, there, was, a, there um, was a couple of times, John, when your guys recovered like Soviet flags, right? Correct. Not us, but other teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, a Marine Corps helicopter pilot, uh, George Miller, who was at the DMZ, he saw a Russian in uniform. By the time he turned around to go back to Waxen, that, that Russian was smart enough to get it back into the jungle. And then, of course, Lynn Black and Doug uh, Laterno, with, when they were on Idaho, in between my tours, they had a guy that came up on the radio who was Cuban. And uh, he was trying to get them to surrender, and uh, they wouldn't. Of course, Lynn... Um, the Russian came up and said, I know where you are. And to show you, this is a secret war now, to give you a sense of how we were compromised. They had a medic on Idaho 
the medic had gone home six or seven days before they got inserted into that target. When the Cuban came up on the radio, he said, I know where you are. Here's your coordinates. Bah, 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 bah. And it's the Frenchman and the black and blackjack. He knew them by code names. Mm-hmm. And he didn't say anything about the third American. They he already knew they were gone. You know, because we've had stories about SOG being compromised. And of course, the fun part of that is at some point, you know, Doug was talking to him. Link goes, Who the hell are you talking to? We're on a mission. He goes, he gives it to Lynn. Lynn got talking to the guy. The guy said, we're going to come and get you. And he said, I got your coordinates. And Lynn goes, let me give you our eight-digit coordinates. I'm on top of the hill. He says, oh, by the way, your mother, well, she must have been a piss-poor whore. Because had she been a good hooker, you wouldn't have got stuck in Vietnam. You would have gotten a good job with the Russians in Europe somewhere. But your mom was a, a piss-poor whore. <laughs> They never came for him. I mean, that means the, the unit was completely compromised from from top. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's two things. You know, um, when the, when the uh, when the ship was uh, captured in Korea, um, the name escaped me right. Yeah, now. it's like red, red something red uh, red tail or shit. It'll like, come. It'll, I know exactly come. what you're talking anyway, about. The Koreans. The Russians asked the Koreans to capture the ship because it was a U.S. ship, had all the radio intel stuff. So the second they come into North Korea port, the Russians took all of the encryption equipment. That was our latest encryption. Then at that time, unbeknownst to our country, the Walkers, the father and son combination, were selling the codes to the Russians in the U.S. Right. So for several years, and this was confirmed later, uh, by the CIA and by the Navy, that they had all those codes. And then years later, uh, we interviewed a CIA agent who had been in Germany who talked to the Russians that confirmed that they were there and they had the codes. They kept saying, we couldn't believe the SAW guys didn't have more sophisticated radio equipment. We could monitor them all the time. Wow. And, and Mac V was compromised in, uh, in Saigon, right? Correct, at the headquarters, yeah. And John Plaster's book, the uh, his coffee table book, there's a picture of uh, Major George uh, Gaspard with the spy. He's right there. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, digging okay. into our library back here. We're digging uh, deep. John Plaster's book, if you guys want That's to. That's the regular book, but his pictorial is the one with the picture of the communist spy with Major Gaspard. And yes, John did. John, I call John the godfather of SOG writers because he was the one that fought the early battles. He was the first mm-hmm. one to do a nonfiction book on SOG. And it's pretty comprehensive. And they followed up with his pictorial. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Um, and, and, you know, all this stuff with the Russians, it, it's, it rings pretty true and consistent with, uh, you know, the other things that were going on in, um, you know, Angola, for instance. Um, and, and then, of course, Afghanistan. So, I mean, it really was a, a worldwide war against, you know, international communism. Absolutely. And, you know, and there have been a couple op-ed pieces um, that talk about how by the Americans fighting communism in Vietnam, other countries, Indonesia, Micronesia, they had a chance to better prepare in Singapore because Singapore's got one of the top spec ops units in the world today mm-hmm. in Southeast Asia. And they had a chance to get ready, and they fought communism there before it got out of hand. So by us holding ground in Southeast Asia, that's one thing that nobody will talk about. And and it was also about reassuring our, uh, our European allies. I mean, after the Suez incident in the 50s, we had kind of snubbed the British and the French and and made them feel, eh, maybe, you know, the United States could go either way as far as having our back. Um, then you have the Berlin Wall go up. You have communism expanding all around the world. Um, we fought in Vietnam to convince the Brits and the French and, the, and you know, our German allies that we were not going to turn away. We were not going to back down from the fight. And, I mean, I, I'd be interested to hear your point of view on, on that, John. And... and 
Was it justified? I mean, you had the the Ken Burns documentary coming at, come out that I know you were very critical of, and but I mean, for someone of my my age, my generation, when I go and look at all the names on the wall uh, in Washington D.C., it, it, it's tough. It's it's tough to deal with, and I know it's ten times more for you guys who were there. And I, I'd really love to hear you know your perspective on it. Well. My, my perspective is, is unique in that on my team, I had four soldiers who came from North Vietnam. At the end of, um, after World War II, the North Vietnamese, the communists, fought the French, mm -hmm. and the key battle was the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Mm -hmm. Well, for 18 months after that, people in the North could go south, and people in the south, if they wanted to, could go north. Well, Thousands of people went south. Nobody went north. Mm -hmm. And the Navy had ships that took thousands of people down. Well, on my team. So I, I say that because all of our guys, they knew that South Vietnam was corrupt. There's no question about that. However, our guys preferred a corrupt government they knew as opposed to the communists. And... They were familiar with it, and anybody who would take a look at the history of the communists, the way they rule today, as well as then, as well as during World War II, the, the, they rule by an iron fist. Look at Hungary, Czechoslovakia, all these countries, Poland. I mean, do it our way or we'll run you over with our military. Mm -hmm. And um, it's our way or the highway. So my perspective was I went back because I really believed in the team and what we were doing. We were fighting communism at a very well, top secret level. And it turns out our casualty rate was the highest in the war from SOG. And, uh, but that mission, I believe in, I still do. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end, now all the major battles, our conventional troops won, the Marines, whoever fought, won the major battles. It was Congress that refused to fund. And, of course, there were some political changes there along the way. And Tricky Dick with the Watergate, that was just, um, you know, a lot of things that came together to hurt the overall mission. So, yeah, 58,000 names in that wall, mm -hmm. not to mention all of our MIAs today. Painful. And how, how many MIAs do we still have over in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia? Yeah, the total today is 1,586. And that includes China and Thailand. There were a few pilots that got downed up there, never heard from again. We lost some in Thailand. And, of course, our recon guys. And plus, you know, the aviator, like you, you guys have experienced our aviation assets, whether they're, in your case, it would be the Apaches and, and, and the fast movers and, of course, your A-30s. Good stuff. And they were dedicated. They're, they're the best air force in the world. We had the same thing, and plus we had the Vietnamese air force. And um, but they 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 paid a price for it. I mean, there was over over a hundred aviators, and some of our bright lights were for the downed aircraft. And uh, you know, to, we just always salute the air force for that for their courage because without them, we wouldn't be here. Without the uh, South Vietnamese Air Force that pulled us out, it was old Sikorsky's, you know. Uh, some of our guys had 50 plus uh, different holes in their in their King B. We had one uh, mission from Echo 4, we had 48 bullet holes, including one that went right through the helicopter uh, rotary blade. And uh, we always left under fire. The only question was how much. Mm -hmm. And how many? But again, you guys know what that's like. <laughs> You've been I, I there. think you said there's what 50 special forces soldiers still MIA right 50 Green Berets from the Secret War that are still there which includes Jerry Mad Dog Shriver Idaho and a lot of other Americans that uh, were there at that time and nobody could talk about it you know and, and the additional side the pain of the side of that is the families because here's a family all they get is a notification from the army that their soldier died. And they'll probably tell them in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, even that's not true. And it's not, the families have gone on, all the parents have died, some of the siblings have died, 
before they ever learn. So in our case, we had the Special Operations Association where we had a reunion and we talk about them all the time as well as we had the uh, our anniversary in uh, 2018 was the 50th anniversary of the night one of our camps got hit at Da Nang where we lost uh, 16 Green Berets in one night. But that was by sappers. They knew who we were. That was specifically designed to attack SOG. So we were compromised and Yes, the casualty rate, and it's painful. Could you talk a little bit about that, about the, the hit on Quantum, um, because I, I know you, you did a ton of research on that, um, although uh, you weren't there, but you, you did a lot of research and wrote about the attack. The Operation Tailwind? Uh, no, uh, CCN, when they got hit. The, the Oh, that was FOB 4, August 23rd, 68. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um FOB-4 was opened in 67, at the end of 67, and um, it was a top secret base. But anything in Vietnam, you know, they, they had their spies. They knew who we were. They had attacked the base briefly in December of 67, but we later learned that they planned for a year a sapper attack on the night of August 23rd, 68, when there was no moon. And uh, they had... We're finding out now some more information about who the exact sapper units were. Some NVA sappers, Viet Cong, and the camp is right next to Marble Mountain. Mm -hmm. And Marble Mountain was, which we didn't realize at the time, had several levels underneath the mountain where the Viet Cong, the locals, and of course on that attack, the NVA were there. So the night of the attack, several dozen infiltrated through the wire into the base and they went into the indigenous troop mess hall where they had a final briefing right on the base. And then after midnight, there's, there's some confusion as to when it was launched. But our recon company was down by the South China Sea. There were three rows of hooches down there. And when they hit, they went down with machine gunners and they lined up at the end of the sidewalk. So anybody coming out would be gunned down. So, like, one of the Hoosiers, we had uh, Doug Gottschall, John Peters, and William Brick III was in there. And John Peters and Doug, because, um, and the reason why they hit that night, there was a promotion board there for the entire CNC. So you had guys coming in for promotion review, and that they had also consolidated the CNC command, and they brought it into Da Nang at the headquarters. And they also had their monthly briefing from all the FOB commanders. So they knew they had a lot of extra people there. So all their intel was right on. And when they hit, they had their machine guns set up down there. They went around to the hooches with the uh, satchel charges. And it was just a free-for-all. And uh, even on the mountain, on Marble Mountain, they had mortals that opened fire. And we had a recon team up there where Larry Trimble and his uh, nuns were able to kill the mortar teams and they were able to suppress them for the rest of the uh, next two or three days. Had they not, the casualty would have been much higher. And there was also, just north of FOB4, was an NVA POW camp that had over 500 NVA soldiers. And they knew the attack was coming and there was an effort to try to break them out. But it was thwarted at the last minute. One of our guys had a gunship that came in and made a gun run right between our base and the POW camp that killed all the sappers that were trying to get in to free the uh, prisoners so they could come join the battle. It was a free-for-all all night. It, it sounded just like total chaos out there. Uh, Absolutely. It, they, so they, they waded in from the water to get around the perimeter defense. Right. Came in on the beach. And you remember when I was writing that article about George Bacon, we talked about this also. Oh, sure. Because Good George, George was <laughs> fucking passed out on the beach <laughs> and got shot in the shoulder when these sappers came <laughs> came up. Uh, we, maybe we talk about George a little later. He is such a character. That's like a whole digression oh, yeah. right there. And um, sadly, he was killed in... Uh, Angola working as a mercenary on Valentine's right. Day 1976, I believe it was. I'd have to take a look. But 
back to Quantum. Um, what was the Denang. counter? What was before Denang. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the <laughs> okay. four. What was um, what was the counter attack? How how did how did these guys begin to repel the sappers that had snuck in? Well, throughout the night, there was no concerted effort. It was individuals that would team up, so the camp was really spread out, and they planned uh, the one key aspect that they missed: the talk. We had opened up a brand new talk two days before the attack. So when they hit when they hit the base, they hit the old talk. Mm-hmm. And we had two or three guys that were killed in there. And um, fortunately, the men who were in the talk were able to fend off the attack and keep it going, as well as the communication center. But they would they kicked in the uh, air conditioners and then they would throw in hand grenades inside. And uh, but our guys were able to uh, get the hand grenades back out the uh, the hole. That was just one of the little sidebars that passed out. And then we had uh, individuals, like there was one guy named Travis Mills. Travis was in a hooch down the recon company. When he came out, he got shot right away. And he sees the guy that shot him. He goes, no, 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 I'm an American. He gets shot again. <laughs> He goes, no, I'm on your side. He got shot a third time. Well, by now, Travis being from Texas and all, he was an officer. So, you know, officers are slow learners sometimes. He finally figured out that maybe this guy wasn't one of our indig, but he got shot two more times. So here he was shot five times. And when the ant- one of the guys was going around with an ambulance, one of the officers was driving the ambulance. And we also had a Navy corpsman who had heard all the explosions and came into base that night to help out pick up some of the uh, wounded. Well, when Travis got picked up, taken back to the uh, dispensary, they they gave, they triaged him and said, well, your five wounds are bad, but they're not fatal. They passed him up and said, you're in charge of security at the back door. They gave him a car 15 and there he was for two or three hours before he finally got taken to the main uh, hospital off, off base. <laughs> But that was just one of the uh, heroes, you know, for that night. But there was a lot of that one-on-one stuff. And, and, and they, um, most of the NVA had just the loincloth. And they, many wore the headbands that said, we came here to die. And they died. It's, one, of them, one of them fucking holed up in the shitter, didn't they? Yeah, they had a couple there. And, and they were the last two that we confirmed. Uh, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of firepower, and they blew themselves up because when they uh, somehow our guys learned they were there because uh, Colonel Barr, Lieutenant Colonel Barr, came down from FOB one at first light, and they started uh, by the POW base, and then they came south to FOB four, came in and started sweeping through the camp, and when that was going on, somehow some of the guys that were in the dining hall heard about these guys in the shitter <laughs> so they went out and there was a firefight and then the guys in the shitter blew blew up the shitter a good shitter and themselves which John, cost the war jack i'm telling you it's a testament to the amount of chaos when the fact that they kicked in the air conditioners into the top they yeah. threw in grenades the people in the top picked up live grenades tossed them back out when that's just a detail of the overall fight and not, you know what I mean? <laughs> like that's insane in and of itself, but that's just one small detail of, of what was going on in that moment. Yeah. We, and we had guys that, uh, I mean, some of the tragic deaths, I mean, like William Breck, Brick, well, as I said, when he came out of his hooch, he was gunned down immediately by the NBA gunners. And we had another Lieutenant who, when the sapper, satchel charge was thrown into the, the uh, transit barracks, the explosion had a two by four that went through and pierced his chest and nailed them, literally nailed them to his bed, killed him instantly. And that was just, you know, just some of these odd things that happened during the night. And the hand, not much hand to hand, but hand grenades and shooting people with the 45s and Pat Watkins and them, they were in their. In their transit barracks, they could see the shadow of this guy 
And Pat only had a 45. He's no good shooting, so he shot a couple times, but they still threw the satchel charge in. This just stuff went on late and all throughout the night. And, and there was some big shit show also with, like, help not arriving until, like, 24 hours later, as I recall. Well, no, that's not right. Uh, Colonel Barr came down from FOB1, and they were there at first light. So the mm-hmm. attack was launched after midnight. Um and the radio signals went down to our headquarters in the Trang. So the Trang set up a force, and they were there by mid-morning or late in the morning. Okay. So, But Colonel Barr got there first, and he, he had a bunch of volunteers from FOB1 that went down with him. And they cleaned house. Anything left over, then they went through the whole camp. And anybody looking for any live POWs as well as our guys who were wounded, just to see what they could do to help. Did and your they, buddy George Bacon, even though he's wounded, he still served and helped some guys. Yeah, yeah, he was a medic. Good. And uh, John, uh, one, when I was doing the research, I found some stuff in John's book, John Plaster's book. Uh, yeah. He was out on he was out on patrol with George a couple times. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot that. Mm-hmm. But George was with us at FOB one, and he's brilliant. I mean, he came into camp. He was assigned to a uh, Montagnard team. Within a week, he was talking Montagnardese with the yards. And then in between, he would hang out with the Vietnamese just to learn the language. So within a few weeks, he was speaking three different languages. He was speaking the brood Montagnard dialect. He picked up Vietnamese well to communicate, and he talked to the Cambodians. The guy was brilliant. And you know, he had these big shoulders. He looked like a walking clothes rack. <laughs> shoulders, and he always wore the ugliest hats in camp. I remember the thing I remember fondly about George is he found ugly hats somewhere, but he was a hell of a soldier and a great medic. George, medic. you know, his, his full name George Washington Bacon the Third, and um, you know John knew him. The a lot of the side guys knew him, of course, um, when he was there. But I wrote an article about him years ago, and the guy is just, he was a super eccentric individual, super high IQ. I think that probably had something to do with it. It was just like John said, he, he, he spoke many languages. He read every single book he could find, and when he ran out of books, he'd go digging through the trash to try to find new books to read. I, I, anything Anything that was printed, he would read it. This guy... He wore a Rolex watch at home, um, but instead of the band, it was like a pink piece of twine that secured the watch to his wrist. Uh, he did not uh, stop at traffic lights. He did not obey. He did not recognize the lawful authority of traffic lights, said, I don't need a fucking machine to tell me when there's cars here or not. <laughs> uh, he drove a Morris Minor. He, 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 some, of his, some of his friends think he gave most of his money away. He wore finely tailored suits because he came from, uh, I was told his family had some connection to Hickney Freeman, big uh, suit company. So he had very nice suits made, but he wore them with jungle boots. <laughs> he built a, this guy built a Harley Davidson motorcycle. He bought the parts at auctions and then composed, he built it over time in his basement and built the Harley. And then his friends looking at him like, George, how the fuck are you going to get out of your basement? <laughs> And he was like, oh, I, I didn't think of that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so his friend had to ride it up the steps, up the basement steps, and went flying out the front door and almost wrecked it. Um, and so George, after, after, after Vietnam, after Mac V. Sag, George went, uh, he was a CIA contractor in Laos doing paramilitary ops over there. Right. You can find stuff about George in James Parker's book about that another cia officer under his um his call sign kayak because that was his favorite sport was kayaking after laos he bounced between the cia and academia and he was uh he went and served as a mercenary in angola um he was just that kind of guy he'd fight communism wherever it was wherever you could find it and there's a lot of contention to this day whether or not he was working for the CIA or not when he was killed. And the, the, the honest answer to you is, I, I don't know. Well, we had heard that they had put up, you know, the CIA has that wall of fame. 
or any of their KIA. We Memorial had heard that there was one a star for it was for George. That one's for him. Yeah. That's what I heard. That that would be fascinating to uncover the truth behind that. Oh yeah. George, man, what a character. <laughs> he was a hell of a medic. I mean he was so bright. I mean No, but the other thing with George was he was a magnet ass. Whatever team he went on, once they were on the ground, they got into a world of shit. <laughs> it wasn't like you'd be on the ground for a couple of days and they figured out to get the tracking dog. No, no, no. They get on the ground and George got hit hard, but he got the team out. He he was just a great guy. I uh, when when I got to the end of writing that article, John, uh, I felt like I had known him, and uh, <laughs> I was. It, I was just so sad that I had never actually gotten the chance to meet him. That you know, he he, he was killed before I was even born. Um, right. The the way that happened actually was that he was with a, a Canadian mercenary also and a few others, and they drove headlong into a uh, convoy full of Cubans and others. It, it's very complicated the politics, but there's Unita. He was with Fenla. And it was like Fenla's dying days in Angola. They were towards the end of their run. Um, and they were actually in the process of evacuating into Zaire um, when they ran into that convoy. And their vehicle just got lit up by machine gun fire. And George was probably dead by the time he stepped out of the vehicle. Wow. Never, never recovered his remains either. Oh, is that right? No. Well. Mm. We uh we have some questions, but my stream froze up, so we're gonna have to ask. Them yeah, questions. sure. But uh, <laughs> so people got some questions for you, John. Machine, damn it! <laughs> uh, Gordon yeah. says, "Always amazed at the scale of the assets needed to insert the recon teams, i.e., backup helicopters, and the number of potential enemy in the AO these teams would face." And any experience or stories with white advisors for the NVA while on SOG missions? I've seen a few different recon soft units. You're from coming to report back. on this. Aussie Sasser included. I think we talked about that, John, but anything you want to add? Um, you just came in broken. I, I, I think he's asking about foreign question. advisors with the, uh, with the North Vietnamese. Oh, well, no, we, we confirmed it. No question about it. Mm -hmm. And even Chinese. They were there, and uh, just a question of how many. And we've confirmed that at multiple sources. So, yeah, Russians. And besides, you know, North Vietnam couldn't have fought that war without the communist bloc behind them. Mm -hmm. That's all. And they, they gave them all the supplies they needed, and uh, including the latest anti-aircraft weaponry. They trained their pilots. And, um, you know, we, some of our pilots killed some of the MiGs, which was good. But they had sophisticated state-of-the-art equipment at that time. And uh, we lost a lot of good airmen over that, in that war up there. There's two wars. You had the war in Hanoi, Haiphong, which is North Vietnam. And then we had the Ho Chi Minh trail aspect of it and our secret war with our missions. And uh, where the Air Force put, paid a high price. And uh, up there you had Navy and Air Force that launched from carriers. So, uh, does that answer his question, Jack? No, I think so. I think so. Um, Chris, uh, this is a good question, actually. What are the differences between SOG and Project Delta, Sigma, Omega, Gamma, etc.? Well, we had uh, the Delta project was set up initially in country, and they were they did tremendous work in country. And like, for example, when A camp was getting hit, Delta Force would go out. And when I first came in country, we were at the safe house and there was a Delta Force team that was there that had just come back from a mission where they had gone into the Ashaw to help relieve one of our hatchet forces or one of our recon teams. I forget what it was. So the Sigma project was CCS. And then uh, um, the the Project Delta guys stayed mostly in country. Then you had Mike Force also. Mm -hmm. And the Mike Force, you know, you talk to a couple of guys from Mike Force, you saw guys, you went in, you did a clandestine mission. That's a good mission for you. When we were in country, we hunted those little fuckers. We went after them. We looked for them. We wanted to engage them and eliminate them. 
and they did. They did great work. I mean, there's some epic stories from the Mike Force yeah, guys yeah. in country. Absolutely. But that's the difference. And uh, Sigma was uh, ultimately became CCS down south. Because in 68, we had six FOBs. They consolidated. So we had CCN and at Da Nang. And then we had CCC, Contum, and CCS. There was a family to it further south. And then to add another layer of complexity to all of this, there's the Phoenix program. Uh, there's all these other oh, yeah. other different projects to confuse people further. <laughs> sure, and the Phoenix program, again, here's one that the, that the AG was involved in. Mm -hmm. We had SF people attached to it, and it was one of the most effective countermeasures against the Viet Cong hierarchy. They would get into the village, learn who the bad guys were, and eliminate them. They were communists. We were at war. But again, the corrupt South Vietnamese sometimes began eliminating political mm -hmm. adversaries as opposed to the communists. And of course, the Washington Post, or one of our friendly publications, got a hold of it and put that negative twist on it, mm -hmm. ignoring all the good that was done. And they never understood truly what a guerrilla war is. Uh, John Mullins talked about that when we had him. Oh, on the John show. would tell you chapter and verse on that. Yeah, he did. Oh, he did. He did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we had him on a while ago. Amazing. And he told me things about Mac V. Saga I didn't even know about you guys running <laughs> double agents across the fence. Oh, yeah, we had a few. But again, this is this wasn't at my level. above my pay grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sneaky. Yeah. Um, John, maybe we could like, um, I, I, well, hell, let's just go for it. The war stories, man. I, I think that there'd be some benefit in kind of like walking people through um, going out on a patrol, going across the fence, what that whole experience was like, kind of preparing for it, going over the border and running recon. Um, I don't know if there's a particular operation that you would be interested in talking about. Um, one that comes to my mind, of course, is uh, that terrifies me when I read about it in your book. Um, when you guys got pushed... You got when you got pushed up into the draw and the and the NVA set the elephant grass on fire around you. Just makes me nervous as hell just reading about it. <laughs> well, you know, that that was small potatoes compared to the Lynn Black. Well, in our case, we got inserted on Christmas Day and it was on a little knoll. And the knoll was really steep on the west and the south side. We couldn't go down. It was just too steep. So we landed, we go east, it's elephant grass. And we're heading to the jungle. We had only been on the ground maybe 20, 30 minutes. I forget now. But we, our point man made contact, minimal. We came back, and the, the northwest side was too steep, and it was quiet up at the northeastern side. So Lynn Black said, you know, we could go there, but it's too quiet. And then we had a radio report that came in said, we have an intelligence report. Now, mind you, we're on the ground. And the intel report says, do not go to the northeast. There's an ambush waiting for you. It turned out that the Frenchman was in another target. He picked up radio transmission of the NVA talking about RT Idaho. They Holy knew it shit. was us in their AO. By name. Doug heard them talking. He told Spider, and Spider tells me, and Lynn and I had already figured that was the one last option if we were going to try to continue. But we had made the contact, so we're compromised. And then that, that was the most historic mission for us because of that radio contact. But so with the firefight going on, the, uh, we had hand grenades. And they sparked flames in the elephant grass. And this fire was coming up the mountain at us. And at one point, Lynn Black and Bubba were putting C4 charges in to literally try to blow the fire back down the mountain to gain some time. And we could not leave the peak. It was too steep on each side. We knew the Northeast had an ambush. And so we were battling the fire. And at one point, you could look through the flames and see two NVA stand there at Port Arms looking at us. Like going, hey, what are you guys doing? It's going to be crispy critter time. Well, luckily, Captain Tuong, the King Bee pilot, came down the mountain sideways 
and the prop wash blew back the flames. We jumped on and left, and the whole hilltop was over wow. overrun, overcome with uh, flames. It's just an amazing moment in time. And, and but that is wimpy compared to Lynn Black. Now here's the mission where Lynn was uh, on the team. They had a new team leader who came in from 10th group. He didn't understand guerrilla warfare, but he was a team leader because he's a senior NCO. So the day before they did a visual reconnaissance and they're flying a visual reconnaissance in a small air of uh, South Vietnamese air force two pilot co-pilot and they're doing a visual reconnaissance a 51 mic mic opened up went around went through the cabin took the pilot's head off with his helmet which landed in Lynn Black's lap and then needless to say they left the AO went right back but that was the target they were going into the next day they launched and the first helicopter went in with the one zero Lynn was on a second helicopter. They had a total of nine men. Well, Lynn saw the NVA flag flying. Lynn had a previous tour of duty with the 173rd. He knew that if there's a flag, there's at least a battalion, 3,000. He talks to this team leader, and the guy goes, no gook's going to run me off my mission. <laughs> so he didn't listen to Lynn, who knew what was going on. Wow. Then... He, com he, did the mortal he committed a mortal sin. He told the team to go down a trail. So they had argued for this. They argued about going down the trail. They finally go down the trail. They're going downhill, and the hill had on the right, uh, like uh, uh, about 30 or 40 feet high, and there was an L. Well, the NVA put 50 soldiers up there. And they, when they walked down, they opened fire. They killed the point man, who was a good South Vietnamese point man. They killed the one zero who made the mistake, and they wounded a third guy who died later that day. And they were in the firefight. And uh, that firefight went on for all day. Now, in that 50 people, when I interviewed Lynn for the book, Lynn goes, I remember shooting some people. They would spin around. I had to shoot them a second and a third time. Well, this mission went on for the entire day where they, they stacked up so many dead bodies that when they did a wave attack, they used the dead NVA soldiers to sit behind that. When they ran out of ammo, they started using NVA uh, gear and equipment and rounds. And uh, at one point, Lynn got knocked out by a hand grenade, and the impact was so severe that it knocked him unconscious, destroyed his car 15, and they woke him up. He went, got back on his feet and uh, carried on. That day, we lost two King Bees. A Jolly Green Giant got shot down. And then ultimately, at the end of the mission, a Jolly Green came down and hovered. And it just went literally chopped trees down to hover in the jungle while Lynn and his team went out. And they got to the helicopter, and they found the Air Force pilot of the Jolly Green that got shot down and his door gunner. And they were able to get them all back to the helicopter. And they were going up the uh, lift. And Lynn went back to the teammate who was wounded. And the guy said, give me your 45. So Lynn gave him a 45. And then as Lynn was walking, running back to the helicopter, the guy killed himself because he knew the NVA were coming. And when Lynn's running back to the helicopter, two NVA come out with their AKs and say, Chu Hoi, meaning surrender. And Lynn just kept coming. They were young soldiers. And Lynn just charged them, grabbed their AKs, knocked the one guy out with the AK, hit the other guy in the face, and he burned his hands because the AK-47s were hot for them shooting at the helicopter. He gets lifted up, gets hoisted out. 30 years later, when they were going back for the body of that 1-0, Lynn got a phone call from a North Vietnamese general who said, I ambushed you that day. And he said, I, I was a colonel then. I set up the ambush. They're talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so finally, um, Lynn goes, you know, that was a bad day. We lost three men. And that guy goes, a bad day for us. You know, we had 90% casualties. Lynn goes, 90%? He goes, yeah, between the air, because we had spads, fast movers, the door gunners, you know, the helicopter gunships, I mean. At one point, when Lynn... And his team was behind the dead bodies. 
they had a wave attack come, and there was a next wave attack. The helicopter came down from the muskets and hovered and opened fire on the pending <laughs> wave attack, then pulled out to help defend. That's the kind of protection they had that day. And uh, so the general goes, yeah, you inflicted 90% casualties. And the uh, link goes, well, we saw the flag. That was a battalion, right? And the guy goes, no. It was an NVA division. I had 10,000 men there, oh and you inflicted 90% casualties. Then the general goes, hey, who, who was the guy standing up in the ambush? The link goes, that was me. He says, you shot me three times. <laughs> so that's one of the classic all-time SOG stories, in my opinion. I in my, to bring him back. For what it's worth, mine too, John. I was I was rereading that story oh, today yeah. when I was going through your book and looking at the highlights I made. Um man, what do you like like that that mission where you know that you were describing that you were on where the elephant grass was on fire. I mean, you were all down to, as I recall, one magazine apiece. That was all you had left. You had Well, at that mission there I wasn't that low. The, the day twice I remember there were times when I went through 600 plus rounds mm -hmm. down to the last magazine. That was Echo 4 on October 7th, where we had been in contact for several hours and we had stacked up some bodies there, but nothing like what Lynn had. And um, that was when we came out on the, when we got pulled out, he hovered, we threw the guys into the helicopter and I was the last guy in. And uh, then we let go to the last magazine and the last hand grenade. And uh, we had been in contact for about four hours. I mean, you told me about, what, how many radio antennas did you have shot off your back during the war? <laughs> no, <laughs> only only two that I can recall. Only two. Only, only two. At this moment in time. Yeah, we had the long antenna up, and it got they got shot off. John, when, you know, you said that uh, the, they knew your team's name. They knew your infiltration points. How did that feel, like when you go back to base and get new missions, did everybody just accept that every single operation you guys went on was compromised somehow? How early did you guys learn that? That's a good question. Like how, would that, how did that feel for you and for the team in general? Well, you know, we, we told the intel guys about it, and, and whenever we had what we felt was we knew there was compromise. I mean, for example, we had one target where um, – we were going into the LZ, and somehow my my little people, one of my indigs, saw a wire across the LZ. So not only did they know we were coming, but they had a trip wire that was tied to a 500-pound bomb. Had he not seen that, had we hit the wire, that 500-pound bomb would have wiped us right out, mm -hmm. gone. So, you know, it's just like the th we all have our mission. You go on the mission you're told to do. We're talking beside, behind lines to ourselves at the club. We talk to the officers. We talk to S2 and say, hey, guys, this is stuff's going on. We tell S3. They have reports that go down to Saigon. But then it's out of our hands, mm -hmm. you know. And then we have to go back the next day. We get briefed. I mean, sometimes they want teams on the ground so bad, they would just give us a target. You look at it. And you get look out on the way out to the helicopter, jump on the chopper and go. So you really wouldn't have much time to really review any of the intel. But again, you know, you, you follow orders and go. Sure. That's one of the it jump. wasn't fun and it was sure. frustrating. We just wished that we'd had more um, response, let me put it that way, from Saigon. I, I had read that you guys started bullshitting Mac V at a certain point lying about the LZs you were going in because oh, you came yeah, to distrust them so much. Yeah, we would and, and we give them the for the for the official report that would go to Saigon, here's our primary, secondary, and alternate LZs. We get to the launch site, you pull a cuppy pile aside and say, hey, we told Saigon this, but you find us an LZ and put us in there. And it worked. I mean, we had much more success that way. And even Nick Brockhausen you know, a year later, Nick was doing the same thing. They were finding their LZs or just tell Covey, go find one. Because like in the early part of 68, we'd always fly a visual reconnaissance. Well, the communists aren't stupid. If they see a bird dog flying around, <laughs> they know that, 
<laughs> the choppers yeah, yeah, are coming yeah, right. and get ready. Right. So were the yeah. Indians that you guys worked with were they were they above suspicion or did you guys not really know where the leaks were coming from? Was there you know was there strife inside the teams? No. Well on my team no. My team was highly vetted. Um the assistant uh, we had our, our counterpart. His name was Sal. So when I got there in 68, Sal had been on the team for three years. Hep, our interpreter, had been on the team for three years at that point. And they, they were good. Sal could smell the enemy. He knew how they thought. And um, so when our team got wiped out, they vetted the Vietnamese we hired. We hired three 15-year-olds and another a member of the team that came on. So I was green. They were green. And because Sal and Hep had been such veterans, I had to earn their respect. Mm -hmm. I had to show that I could live up to their standards to, to justify being on the team. And uh, it took a few months. You know, Sal was a hard customer. Um, but uh, so on our individual team, no. And on some of the really good recon teams, because the Green Berets would work with the indigenous people closely enough that it was not a problem. However, sometimes with hatchet force, the bigger force of the Cambodians, sometimes you had issues there. And Lynn Black, later, uh, I think it was 1970, he was given uh, a North Vietnamese team that converted. And they were supposedly wanting to work. Well, Lynn took them down to the range one day, and they're down there training. At some point, Lynn found that he was standing by himself, and all the enemy troops were behind him and they all the enemy troops turned their guns on Lynn and said put your gun down we're leaving so Lynn goes oh okay he throws his gun down but the NVA forgot that Lynn had his radio so when they left the range he he could kept track of them he called up Covey was able to make radio contact and called in a gunship and wiped them out wow Jesus oh yeah yeah, Lynn Black is one slick soldier, I'll tell you, man. I wouldn't want to piss him off. Even to this day, I wouldn't want to piss him off. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have to admit, I, I have not read Lynn's book yet. It's, it, it's out. People want to find it. It's uh, Whiskey, Tango, Foxtrot, right, John? Yes, sir. And, and make sure it's the, uh, it's the small book version, like the uh, uh, five and a half by eight and a half. Because he came out... When he first did his book, it was a bigger format, mm -hmm. but it had no prologue. The ah. smaller version has the prologue, which includes his time with the 173rd, where his brother got shot up really bad. And uh, his brother, you got hurt there. And one of the reasons why Lynn got out after the 173rd, he got out for a little bit of time. But then he decided, I want to go back to Special Forces. I want to take some revenge for my brother, you getting wounded, right? <laughs> and... Uh, and he talked to his brother, you, and you goes, what the fuck are you doing? I'm back. I'm alive. You don't have to go back for me. <laughs> well, then went back, and he did take, he, he killed some communists. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yes. Oh, it's a, it's a phenomenal book. I mean, I'm sorry. I've read it a few times now because uh, it's because you get into Lynn Black's head on some of this stuff. It's really, but also his leadership skills. He just took over that team. You know, the one zero was killed. The other American on the team at that mission, he never fired one round. He was there praying and crying. Really? Yep, I remember that. Oh, yeah. Book. Just a complete coward. John, can you tell us about your first mission in country? Like what you were expecting, what, how it went down for you? Because that must have been a bit of a culture shock, right? Yeah, we, well, we did a couple in-country ambushes at night. And so it was just in-country training and no big deal. Our first real mission across the fence was into the Ashaw Valley. We inserted the um, Air Force sensors. It had a mm -hmm. big central unit with coaxial cables that went out, maybe 20 feet. So we had to bury everything, leave the antennas up. Well, this is my first mission. So I'm the low man on the total pool. Me and Hep has security at one end, and um, Don Wolken has security at the other end. And then Spider Parks was our one zero. So prior to going in, we figured, oh, shit, this is, it's showtime. You know, we load up with extra bullets and everything. And um, true to the form, the NVA fight when they want to fight. 
We went in, put in the whole device, everything, slick as snail snot. Choppers came back. We never fired a shot. And when we left, uh, an NVA door gunner opened up. With, I mean, an NVA gunner with a 51 caliber opened up. Well, we had so much tack air, they came down and killed him four or five times just for good luck. But, you know, again, we're thinking, oh, it's going to be a firefight. It's the Ashaw Valley. Like Ken Miller, those guys had all earned their purple hearts down there. Mm-hmm. And, um, but not a shot fired. And then we did the same thing. We put in sensors at Quezon, right where the right where the whole historic battle had occurred, because there was a lot of enemy traffic there. We put that sensor in, and then um, we had also run a mission on the east side of Yashaw. No contact. Went in for four or five days. Did reports. Then in Echo Four, and that was the one we went in. The, right the day after Lynn Black was extracted on October six, we went in. He got it. Extracted on the fifth, we went on the sixth, we made contact on the seventh. And that's where we stacked them up and I went right down to the last magazine. So that that lived up to expectations and that was like a real eye opener. Mm-hmm. But again, Sal and Hep opened fire on the NVA before any of us Americans knew it. They hit them first and they did the magazine change, so we had fire superiority right away. No, and one other, just one little sidebar. You know how you have tunnel vision in a firefight? Mm-hmm. Well, I was in the middle of firing one of the main areas that they were coming at us out in the jungle, and Fook, our point man, opened fire. So I'm shooting here. I thought he was shooting over my shoulder. And we got back to base uh, the next day. We were talking, and I said, I couldn't hear because he just like the rounds. You know how it is when you're in front of a. Well, in your case, an M4A1 blasting away. I said, fuck, what the fuck? No, I couldn't hear. Why were you shooting over my shoulder? He goes, you didn't see down the hill there was some NVA coming up. I killed them. I wasn't shooting over your shoulder. Yeah. So the tunnel vision of the moment, had he not done that within seconds, I would have been a KIA. So, you know, that's just one of those little moments in time. Yeah. You were getting flanked and you were completely unaware because you were, your focus oh, yeah. was, yeah. So I'm green as grass, acting stupid there with folks saving my ass, you know? <laughs> yeah. What was, uh, like, the composition of your team in, in terms of, like, Americans and Indige? Well, we had, um, in the beginning, it was three Americans. And then we had uh, nine Vietnamese. So the Americans would usually would run all the missions. And then we would rotate the Vietnamese. So for the first few months, though, it would be Hep and Sal. Hep's our best interpreter. Sal was the team leader, and then he had trained up Fook to be our point man, and then the other team members were trained. So that by the time we got into November and December, where we're running multiple missions, particularly on the days we would go out in the morning and get shot out of a primary, secondary alternate, come back, refuel another target, same thing. Our little people were getting worn out, so we'd rotate them, mm-hmm. but the Americans would stay on. And uh, so uh, in our case, we had nine or ten South Vietnamese great guys. I'm alive today thanks to them. And of course they king be the South Vietnamese uh, Air Force and all the air assets. But our guys were wonderful. And they trained up. It took them a while. But but when I came back from my second tour of duty, Idaho was tight. And uh, Hep had trained a couple of the, of the South Vietnamese to speak English so that if I got shot or any of the Americans got shot, the South Vietnamese could pick up the radio, direct airstrikes, and talk to Covey and whatever else needs to be done. We trained them up that way. That's part of our cross training, you know? Yeah. So it so was. Our team was, we were just blessed. We had a great team. And there were nuns, uh, other teams that had his, historic uh, team members that uh, they would literally put their life down. Like the Frenchman, he was one night, he was calling home. He put together a tape for his mom and dad. And his uh, point man came in and said, said, Doug's parents, I want to thank you for sending Doug here. Don't you worry. I'll protect him. If they shoot him, I will catch his bullet. Thank you for sending your son. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And, and so I, I, I'd just like to hear uh, one more second on the composition of the team. The Americans were, I believe, 1-1, one, 1-2, one, 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 And then you had, what, four or five indigenous personnel. Right. So by, by the time... I got to uh, January of 69. 
my little people were so good, I just had another American. So Bubba Shore left uh -huh. the team, Lynn Black came on. And Lynn was just a phenomenal guy. So we ran some missions, nothing historic, just routine stuff, or sometimes getting shot out of a target. And then we had a special mission, the one that the pitcher is there. We were all geared up for it. We're on the helicopters. We're launching, and they called us back. And we never never got on the ground on that mission. And uh, so that was right at the end of my tour of duty. And uh, two days later, I rotated home and went back to Fort Devens for a few months, then came back in October of 69. Uh, Lynn was still to 1-0. The team was tight. The Frenchman had been with him. So it was the Frenchman and Lynn. And then it was Lynn and I. And then about January, they said, hey, you guys have got too much experience here. So then Lynn went off the team, and I, then I took over. We took turns being 1-0. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. It's such a oh, yeah. unique so, arrangement. And for the too. missions, we always had four. I prefer a six-man team because if the shit is really in the fan and there's heavy enemy fire, one chopper would take the whole team out. Mm -hmm. When you had eight, uh, there are questions of, uh, of altitude, elevation, enemy fire, just trying to get the second helicopter sometimes was 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 fatal. It was a fatal mission. So um, that's why that's why I preferred. Some other guys like going in heavier. Yeah. And by seventy seventy one, like I said, uh, when Jack and I were talking before the show, like Nick Brockhouse and those guys, they all carried RPDs, and carried he carried over a thousand rounds for the RPD. And when Eldon Bargewell earned his uh, Distinguished Service Cross, he was shot in the face. And he continued to lay down suppressing fire when the team was evacuated and uh, with his RPD. And he went right down to the last couple of rounds. And, you know, Eldon was a, a fixture, a, a legend of the special operations community just passed oh, yeah. away a few <laughs> years ago. Or, or maybe just a just a year ago, really. It wasn't it wasn't long ago. Yeah, we lost him two years ago. Two years ago, John, you guys were really being called upon. You know, you, you when you say uh, we did these missions, nothing historic, but you were really being called upon to really sacrifice, to hook and jab, to to mix it up in in ways that I think are beyond most of us. How often would guys show up? from you know sf and not be a good fit for that not be a good match well there are a few but you know um like that mission i had with echo four i had a guy on a team he had been in the 173rd he had a tour of duty with the 173rd so by october of 68 we had lost so many people that sod was bringing in airborne troops then eventually in 69 they even brought in some legs if they had combat experience so you never knew. We we had to get bodies to fill the slot. So in answer to your question, on that mission, after we were done, Jim Davison, he was the uh, one two on that mission. Even though I carried the radio, he was the new American on the team. Don was the one zero. I was assistant team leader, and uh, but Jim was great on the ground. He was tough. He hung in there, and he was he couldn't ask more of him. Two days after the mission. He came up to me and said, hey, man, um, I can't do this. He said, I had a tour with a herd. I, I've never seen anything like this. and I've never seen anything like that. I don't know if I could ever do that again. And he says, you won't hold that against me. I said, no, why would I do that? You're honest. I appreciate that because if we went to the field another time, we don't know what would happen. This way you're telling me. And I said, you and I went to the Ashall. We survived it, and we came back thanks to you. Sure. So I have no grudge. I would say, you want me to go to the sergeant major? We'll get a new assignment. And that's what I did. I went to the sergeant major. Jim got another assignment. And there were other Americans that uh, some guys didn't want to be one zeros. Mm -hmm. And we had some guys that would come in. Look at the guy on Lynn Black's team. Complete coward. Total coward. But he, um, he was, it took a while, but he got transferred to other duty. And even then, he would create some, some issues. But that's another story. So in answer to your question, some SF guys said no. And it was a volunteer operation. And, you know, originally it was if you ran for six months, you could take six months off.
for the end of your duty. Well, we just needed bodies. And it would be up to the individuals. And uh, I respected anybody who said, I can't do this. And you know how it is. You prefer to have a guy be honest and say, I can't do it. And that way, you don't have to worry about him in the field. Because the guys, and even Bubba Shore. Bubba came up to me. He'd been on, we ran a shitload of missions with Bubba. He was a great guy. And he came up to me in January and said, look, um, do you? I've been offered a job at the... Uh, at the headquarters company. I said, do you mind? I said, no. I appreciate it. Because we had been in a target and he had hesitated a little bit. One time, one, one order I gave him, which we talked about and on the ground. And I was just wondering. And when he told me that, after we're back at the base, I said, no, Bubba. I said, you, you're a stud, man. I love you. You're part of the brotherhood. And whatever you need me to do, I'll help you whatever job you want. And, uh, by that time, Lynn Black was ready to rock and roll, so I knew I had Lynn. Mm. And uh, you know, he placed a good man with an outstanding man. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things is sometimes you never know what's going to shake a person. And, sure. and it doesn't take away all of their service up until that point. Right. You know, And all the things that they've done just because... Yeah, you never know until the, first, until the lead's in the air, right? Right. And... Uh, and we've had some historic cases of guys folding up under fire. Well, <clears throat> when somebody says, no, I can't, at least they're honest enough. So you got men in the field. And in my case, again, I was lucky. I had Spider Parks, I had Combat Experience, Don Wilkin. They were my two one zeros before I became the one zero. And uh, they took good care of us. You know, they, they got us in and out. More importantly, got us out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, we have some more questions real quick. Uh, thank you, uh, Vulcan. Um, what are your thoughts on Russian FSB saboteurs in Ukraine killing other soft soldiers? Was there anything similar to that in Vietnam? Well, we had the sapper attack at FOB4. Mm -hmm. And um, we were told that they were planning an attack at FOB1, but we closed it down before the attack came. Um, we... There was some of that. Our special forces uh, at the A camps had some issues with indigenous troops that they hired who went sideways on them in a firefight. Or if the A camp would be assaulted, some of them would open fire on our guys. So that was at the traditional A camps. A um, couple of our recon teams had issues where the little people ran but they didn't open fire on the Americans. So in Stog, to the best of my knowledge, and there might be other guys that had different experiences, I don't know, um, we didn't have that. But Special Forces, there were some really horrible cases of the friendly fire mm -hmm. or our, our allies uh, working, being aligned with the Viet Cong or the NVA. So it was there. Maybe not as dramatic fashion as today in Afghanistan when they get into the base camp and they kill a bunch of uh, American soldiers as well and whatnot. But that blue on blue, was it, Jack? Is that the proper phrase? Uh, yeah, blue, blue on, on blue, blue and then blue on green would be when that... Well, blue on blue would be America on America and blue on green would be in, indige, yeah. friendly indige, no, in air quotes, on Americans. Right. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, thank you, Ian, for uh, the donation. Stories about about a King Bee pilot named Cowboy. Did you ever meet him? Any stories, direct or indirect, about the man? No, I never met Cowboy, and there were more than one Cowboy who was a Vietnamese helicopter pilot. Both were extraordinary. Both were fearless. And the one Cowboy he's mentioning there uh, died early in the Vietnam War on a mission where he got shot down. And, uh, again, extreme courage he had uh, he had performed a couple of amazing missions where he went in under heavy fire and pulled our teams out and uh, um, but that's the cowboy of legend from the King B side on on Alabama Lynn Black's team there was a South Vietnamese codenamed Cowboy who was a big tall Vietnamese and he's still alive he's up in San Jose and uh, he was just absolutely fearless. John, was was it your book? I may be getting my wires crossed. I can't remember which book I read it about in, where one of the South Vietnamese pilots was on the airstrip 
and a CH-47 came barreling down on them. And he starts screaming at the, the, the Americans, like, you got to get out of the way of the CH-47. He's like, we in Vietnam. I am Vietnamese pilot. Americans, get out of my way. Oh, no, no, that was me. That was you? I was me with Captain Tuong. <laughs> <laughs> the King Bee pilot, Captain Tuong, let me fly co-pilot. So one day we're flying from Phu Bai up to Quang Tri, the launch site, right? And so I'm co-piloting, and yeah, you're right. Here comes a Marine Corps Chinook, a lot bigger, a lot uglier. And we're on a collision course. And so he could see, Captain Tuong could see me going, eh, I'm thinking about moving out of the way here. He goes, no move. And I'm going, he's bigger than we are. He said, no move. We're Vietnamese Air Force in Vietnam. The Marines will move. And they did. They, they turned to the last second, and they're all flipping the bird at us and everything. and everything. You know, but, hey, buku zin loi, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Captain Tuong, we just buried him a couple of, uh, last month, sad to say. Uh, you, you guys were boys, and, and like, you knew him in, when he immigrated to America and everything. Yeah, he went back. Uh, after Vietnam fell, he had to go back for family. And the damn communists got him. And his wife told me this time, I thought it was five years. She told me he was incarcerated in a re-education, quote, re-education camp mm -hmm. for eight years. Jesus Christ. But he escaped, came back, got a great job, and uh, he raised his family. And, of course, they've all got their uh, college degrees. And uh, sadly, we, we uh, had his funeral back in uh, July. I, I'm glad that he got here, though. And oh, me too. Yeah, you kidding? We got the guy called him up every Christmas, Captain Tuong. You remember where we were Christmas 1968? <laughs> and he goes, "Yeah, I remember." And he was just as cool the last time I talked to him as he was that day. I mean, to come down that hill, that mountain, flying sideways mm -hmm. like he did. And he's the one that that pulled me out the day I was upside down. He's the one that landed. Oh, same guy. When I passed out. Oh, yeah, that's why the Captain Tuong, I love you, Buku, baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Andy, uh, Barber, thank you very much for the donation. Uh, Andy just said Semper Fi, brothers. Well, thank you. Uh, General Crane, thank you. Uh, good evening from Ireland, John. Question, what was the vetting selection process for the Indige on SOG teams? Uh, thanks for the great interview. And we covered that a little bit. Yeah, well, in, in my case, it was our Vietnamese did it. They would go out, and most of the recon teams, the team leader, the Vietnamese or the Chinese, Nung, or uh, the Montagnards, they would recruit. The Montagnards would recruit from their families and their village. The Nungs would come from, they had a Sholong, which was the part of uh, Saigon that was all Chinese. The Nungs came from there. So the Nungs would recruit the Nungs from their community. And then my South Vietnamese, I'm not sure where, where Hep and Sal got them, but every one that, we, that they recruited, they're outstanding troops. It took a couple of a little slower learning, but once they got up to speed, they were fearless, completely yeah. fearless, and just great men in the field. John, I want to ask you a little bit about you know the post-war experience and how your book and, and eventually books came about that – you know, when you came home from Vietnam, correct me if I'm wrong, like, you kind of put the war to bed. Like, I'm done with that. That's over. Getting on with your life. And the beginning of Across the Fence, you tell this story that is just so haunting about your daughter playing the piano. And you're looking out the window and watching the fog come across your backyard. Yeah. Yeah, we were at a piano lesson in Vista. And uh, that was my youngest girl. And uh, it, you, you know how these flashbacks, you never know when they're going to hit you. And so I was in the, on the back porch. And I could hear her playing. And, uh, yeah, and those clouds came in. There's trees. They started with the trees. And then there's some clouds and stuff that came in. And all of a sudden, I'm in Laos. I was there. And I was talking to Bubba. I'm talking to, the, uh, uh, to Covey. Because that was a mission where they had put us in. We had made, we had hoped to stay on the ground, 
But by the end of the day, we knew they were on us and they were coming at us. And then we had had heavy contact and we had to blast our way through an area of where soldiers had attacked us. But we were able to get through them after the gun run. And we found an area where we could come down with the strings. And it was right at the end of the day. It was foggy. And the helic- I remember looking up to the helicopter once the ropes came out. It looked like a toy. It looked so far away. And all of that came back. And uh, we had been in contact for, gosh, maybe 45 minutes or an hour. And it was heavy. They kept coming at us, but we had moved. And they couldn't quite tell where we were. And so when we finally got pulled out, um, I had Bubba put a, uh, a claymore and he put a white phosphorus grenade, taped it to the front of it. And uh, so we had it. So we, I forget how we rigged it now, but as we went up, we detonated that thing. And that helped us give us a few more seconds during the extraction. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it was like, I'm back in Vista. But wow. you know, my body was sweaty. And because uh, I, I didn't think we were going to get out. I really, that day. That was the one day I really thought we were dead meat, either then or it's going to be later that night, because they were going to come with us with lanterns and dogs again, and we didn't have enough high ground to hide like we did in the, back in November. But uh, oh yeah, it came back, Jack. It really did. And how did that impact you? That you started you started thinking about the war again. How did that coalesce? Well, you know, I. The best way to handle it, you compartmentalize it. It's kind of like, holy shit, where'd that come from? This is like, I forget what year it was now, but Elena was really young. It was her piano lesson. So uh, she was like five or six, mid, like mid 2003, 80s. 2004, or something like that. Oh, even later. Oh, uh, yeah. And so it came back. I mean, and, uh, but, you know, the moment is I'm there with Elena and Anna's there for the piano lesson. So it's like, Daddy, did you hear me play whatever the song was? Yeah, you did great, kid. You know, it was like, get back to being a dad. This is where you are now. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and and then I had that nightmare with Captain Tuong. The nightmare I had for years that haunted me was on, instead of Captain Tuong coming down the mountain, it was a young lieutenant who we had been warned about by the other King pilots said, if you get this lieutenant, try to avoid him being a lead king bee. He could be a backup, but not the lead king bee because he was still learning and they were worried about his courage. So that, that's kind of rapport we had with the king bee pilots. My nightmare, it was him coming down the mountain instead of Captain Tuong. And so instead of him coming all the way down and the prop blown the flames away, he pulled away and then I felt the heat of the flames come up. And that nightmare stuck with me for quite a while. And it came back a couple of times, even after I married Anna. I mean, we've only been married for 25 years now. But uh, I haven't, it hasn't come back much the last few years. Is this kind of a, the, what inspired you to write down your experiences? So what, what was it that got you to write the first book? Well, it's my wife, really. Uh, we had talked about it. And... Uh, because I, because of the secret war, and because I had done some stuff for Soldier of Fortune, mm-hmm. you know, I, I had a nom de guerre with Soldier of Fortune and Bob Brown, and uh, by the time that Anna and I got around to talking about the book and stuff, it was around 2000. So we had Elena and four teenagers in the house, and I'm talking to her. I'm going, honey, I like to. I've been thinking about writing a book, and she goes, No, you got to write it. Start now. I go, honey, we got four teenagers and a, and, a, and a young little girl running around here. She goes, I'm with you. And she has. She backed me up every day, every way. First book, second book, third, the audio books. She's always there. It's been like my blessing from the Lord, you know, to have my wife. That's amazing. Without her, I'd still be trying to put together the first book, man. <laughs> did, did, did Anna understand what you – did you ever tell her what you did in Vietnam up until that point? Um, you know, it was, she had some curiosity. So yeah. I would talk to her about it, just like with the kids, you know, if they ever asked the question, answer the question up to the extent that they want to hear it. And Anna was curious. I mean, 
she's a sweetheart. And, she, and uh, as the longer we're together, the more she wanted to hear. And then when she finally met Spider and some of the guys, they would go, hey, you know what this knucklehead did in Vietnam? She said, well, yeah, he ran recon. No, no, no. Do you know what this knucklehead really did? <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah. And so over time, and plus she's been to a couple of, uh, of events now where I've been a speaker or something like that. And she knows the story. She's read the books now. And uh, she's my, she's my uh, besides me and my sweetheart, She's there, my biggest fan, and uh, she's helping out all the time, wanting to help more. So we get, we're here, and I'm in Tennessee now. She's back in Oceanside wrapping things up, and then uh, she's got some more plans for how to push out more books and Good. maybe do some podcasts. We'll come back and talk about some more podcasts in here. For sure. Do some Tilt Talk. <laughs> Love it. Actually, you never even told us how you came by the nickname of Tilt. Pinball Machines. See, like, you guys play pinballs, and you lose, you walk away pissed off, right? When I lose, I shake the shit out of the machine. <laughs> I get to see my nickname in neon. At least I get a little satisfaction, you know? John, John this, will, this will absolutely make your day. You'll never forgive me for this. In, in Manhattan, there's a pinball living museum, Good. which I, I took my daughter to to introduce her to pinball machines because these – these dang fangled kids and their Nintendo Switch and all this other stuff. Oh, yeah. I took her and I, I got her introduced. They have pinball machines from like the 1960s up until today. And uh, it's like Vegas? It's, no, no, in New York City. It's, uh, oh. it's on like Second Avenue. And we went wow. up there and I took her and it's like, hey, kid, this is, the, this is what uh, grandma's video games were like. Went, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's. You know, here's my embarrassing story, Jack. It seems how we're on embarrassing. I had my second daughter, Meredith. We were at a pizza parlor one night. She's five years old. She could barely reach the flippers. She beat me. She just beat me <laughs> this thing, man. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> John, how did, uh, you know, it was a secret war. You guys yep. signed all these non-disclosure agreements. We're told never to talk about it, things like that. How did how did it all start to come together after the war? The 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 meetings, the the organizations, people actually feeling you know getting to the point where they could talk about it, find each other, things like that. Well, in my case, uh, I, I had taken down some of the names of our guys, and there's a couple like Lynn, Doug Letourneau, the Frenchman, Rick Howard, and uh, that we stayed in some contact with after the war for a few years. And then over time, each one would fall off. Now, Lynn and I uh, would talk occasionally. The Frenchman, we and I, he and I talked until about 79. Uh, when I moved to, uh, to California and then my parents moved, we lost contact with Doug and uh, a lot of the other guys. And then Spider Parks called me up in 1983 and said, hey, there's a special operations association. It was formed by SOG Recon and Hatchet Force. And then the uh, leadership brought in all the aviation units, the SPADs, all the door gunners and the helicopter pilots, the gunships and whatnot. So they're all they're eligible for membership in the uh, SOA. And so through there, it was, we began going to the reunions. I mean, the first couple of years, me and Jeffrey Junkins, uh, the reunions were always in Vegas. And we would um, drive out. We wait for security to leave. Go, they go to the bathroom. We'd sneak into the reunion, right? Get the free food, the free drinks, and we'd find one of our guys and we'd crash on the floor at night and then go back home. But we'd see the guys, and then uh, <laughs> and then uh, we lost Jeff. And then I took my wife, and uh, Anna wasn't too impressed with the hotel, so she had a few years away from it. But pretty much every year we get together, and that that helped out. And then uh, on a very serious note, the SOA has been uh, doing video recordings of their history. So now we've got over 125 video recordings of, of uh, SOG Recon, SOG Hatchet Force, and some of the aviators. And I think we include one for Jack Singlob, who um, was in the OSS, Spec Ops for Korea. He was the officer in charge of SOG for two years. And then, of course, he he campaigned vigorously, raised money for the Contras, fighting the uh, 
the commie bastards down there in Nicaragua. I have his book right here across from me, Hazardous Duty. Indeed. Amazing book. And even Jack, I mean, think about it. Here's Jack Singla before World War II at UCLA coming into contact with the communists on campus and how screwed up they were. And then at the French resistance with Jack, there's two kinds of resistance. The communist side yep. and a side that the Americans were aligned with. And the communists would only do things that would generate headlines. Mm -hmm. They knew it. And they were political even in World War II, those bastards. There's a, there's a fascinating interview with Jack Singlob in The Sentinel, which is the SFA newsletter out there. In, in, uh, oh, I heard about that. Mm -hmm. it, it's really good. And, and Singlob talks about that, about how in Nazi-occupied France... The communist uh, partisans would do things to like undermine the other partisans, and they even would set up like fake drop zones so that they would get the resupply drops from the allies <laughs> rather than the other guys. Yeah. Really, really yeah. interesting stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm, right now I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, which is where Jack lives, and hopefully I'll have a cup of coffee with him on Sunday morning. Well, give, give us our regards. Uh, I know. I've got a long list of people that I'm giving regards to Jack on, but for sure, I'll add that to the list. An a absolute legend. Uh, <laughs> uh, John, I think uh, you know. there's a lot here, and there's so much more we could get into, but um, there's another guy who had a question here, and I, I think this is a, actually a good one. But um, just before we get that, I want to say to our viewers real quick, there's like 230 people just watching this live, John. Um, and there will be many more in the subsequent days. Just want to say we really appreciate all you guys showing up, giving the uh, attention for John and Mac V. Sog, and this is really a story we all believe needs to be told. Um, John's books are Across the Fence, On the Ground, Sog Chronicles. You want to do some more research. Um, we talked about Lynn Black's book, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. We talked about John Plaster's book, uh, which is just called Sog. Uh, I just mentioned Sing Lop's book, Hazardous Duty. So those oh, are some yeah. good places for you guys to begin your own research. Um, I, I think I probably the place to... book out now for Across the Fence. I, I think that's... That... On the ground. I hope you on the ground will be released. Uh, across, Thank the, you. across the Fence is the place to start, in my opinion. Um, it, it's one of my favorite memoirs to come out of the Vietnam War. And I, I've read a lot of these at this point. Um, no, <laughs> I'm not trying to be a smart ass. Really, it, it is a really good book. Um, and otherwise, I just want to let everyone know um, and remind you: if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to it. Please give us a little thumbs up or thumbs down if you think we suck. Uh, leave a comment below. Tell us how you think we're doing. And uh, there's also a link down in the description for our Patreon page if you want to support the web or support the channel, support the stream if you like what we're doing and keep us running. And that will also give you access to the bonus segments that I hope I can twist your arm into doing for, for a hot minute here, John. Uh, I just got like... Yeah, whatever you need. What do you need? Right. I just got a couple follow-ups for you know, sure. 10, 15 minutes and um, some interesting things we'll get into. Hey, remember, my wife's in Oceanside, so I'm right here. I'm, I'm ready to roll, but I'm yours. <laughs> Geographical bachelor. <laughs> I mean, you got Dave back, so I'm really happy to see Dave. It's like yeah. an honor here with such a living legend like Dave and you. So I'm here, buddy. <laughs> Too kind. John, we are so honored and grateful uh, for your time. And so SR Gross asks, uh, when is your new book coming out, and how can we get your books? Well, the books are on Amazon, and that's the quick way to get them. And... Uh, they're all available, three books, and then book four probably won't be starting until a little bit later this year because of moving and all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, doing some, we're dealing with some family issues. So I'll get going on that. Like I said, we're going to, like Anna has really encouraged me because of uh, podcasts we've had with you, Jack, before and, and others that uh, we want to. Think about it. We'll do more to get yeah. exposure, to get the you SOG should. story, the maximum exposure. Because our guys in SOG, as well as those who supported us, I mean, the aviators, um, you know, we had a SPAD reunion for Operation Tailwind. Uh, we had it in Tennessee at the uh, Tennessee Aviation Museum in Sevierville 
four years ago. I think it was four or three years ago. And it was amazing because this is the first time that I met and shook hands with a SPAD pilot. Right. All those times that they came in and delivered ordnance, danger close. I mean, I, I told them, I remembered from SPADs and from uh, the musket door gunners, they were so close that we had the 7.62 cartridges in our neck of our burning our skin. But I never complained because that was that close coverage. I mean, and those SPADs, like on my last mission, the SPAD runner made a gun run. And he came back and made a second gun run. And he turned the plane a little. He looked over at me. And I could tell you, he was so close, he was smoking a Philly cheroot. And then I saluted him because, <laughs> you know, but these are guys we met. So we never knew who these aviators were that, that saved our bacon time after time. Yeah. And yeah. so that's one of the things what the SOA does and that reunion with the SPAD pilots particularly. Some who remembered being there for Lynn Black on October the 5th. Just amazing. I think you should do it, John, because you know all of these guys and they'd be comfortable talking to you and you can really break some ground that, you know, that, that's never been done before. I, I think you should definitely go for it. Yeah. Well, we will. I'll talk to you more about that uh, when we get off, off camera. Absolutely. 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 Thank you. And anything we can do to support you. I mean, this is history and people that the world needs, you know, we need to know about. It needs to be recorded. It, it needs to be there. And, well, you guys, too, I mean, people are doing podcasts now. This is the new wave of social media that's amazing because people are tired of what the garbage and crap they see on the boob tube. Yep. And there's just, you know, and there's so many of the media that lie where what you all are doing and others, the podcasts are coming out that talk about, they hear the stories. That's just, I, I, I salute what you all are doing yeah. too, man. So I appreciate well, it. What it is is that people want to hear from you. Yeah. They want to hear from John you are the guy, you are there, they want to hear it from the horse's mouth, and, you know, that's what this is. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, it's the Mutual Admiration Society. Yeah, very much so. Uh, we have it's more fun when you talk to veterans like you guys. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Well, like, like I said, we feel honored. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Andrew Dunbar, thank you. Um, how prevalent was amphetamine use amongst the team? Uh, I have heard stories of which I am unsure of their veracity. Well, we had what they were called green bombers, which were amphetamines, which uh, you could take them if you wanted to stay up all night. And I never tried it because very early on, you know, when I arrived in May of 68, there were still some elements around from the Tet Offensive. There were still enemy units that were in the villages and they would attack our base on occasion. They fire in rockets or they mortar us. No ground attacks by May, but anyways, we would go out and do ambushes. Well, one night I was on guard duty, and the mortar pit started firing mortars. Boom, 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 and the mortars were landing in support of a team that set up an ambush outside the Fulon, the village. So we hear the rounds impacting, but there's no gunfire. I mean, there's no AK, there's no SKSs. Now, there's some, there's some uh, our weapons are being fired, American rounds. So somebody called this guy up and said, hey, what the hell's going on out there? We don't hear any enemy gunfire. Oh, no, they're coming through our wire. They're coming right at us. They're coming through our perimeter. And the radio operator said, who? No. The green elephants, they're coming right through our perimeter. The guy was high on the amphetamines. Really? And he had an optical illusion that the green elephants were coming through his defensive perimeter. And it's like, okay, I just learned a lesson. I ain't touching that stuff. I'm crazy <laughs> enough without drugs. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I could be fundamentally dangerous. You start pumping that stuff in my body. So I never touched them. But some guys did. They used them to stay up all night, and they could go three or four days. Yeah. So I don't know about others, but in my case, I was afraid of it. So, yes, some people did have it. They were available, and but they were used in a, uh, a, a mission-oriented basis. Right. Was there abuse? Probably. 
But again, on our team, we didn't see it. And with, either with the Americans or the South Vietnamese. Dave, do you want to do a, a quick uh, teaser for next week's guest? Oh, uh, next week we have on a, uh, a former military close action, uh, close action, uh, uh, they're what, cap teams? Cap teams, yeah, close action. I don't know what the P stands for. Platoon? No. Anyway, uh, close action team. Uh, so they were essentially the, uh, the guerrilla warfare element of the Marine Corps uh, during Vietnam. Uh, rarely, rarely heard right? from. Did they work with Force Recon? Uh, actually, the way they worked was sort of the same as SF teams in villages uh, working with the indigenous. No kidding. Yes. Uh, I never heard that because when we were at Fubai, we had the Force Recon guys would come by. And uh, they were always short. We would give them extra hand grenades, extra bullets. And in 68, some of the Force Recon guys were still carrying M14s. It's just like, hey, here, take all the bullets you want. Anything we can give you guys. God bless you, man. Yeah, but they were going into the Nashville. Combined Action Pacification Program. Oh, so it's not cl close action. Combined, what is it again? Combined Action Pacification Program. Yes. Um, and and on top of that, like just a massive, a very interesting personal story. There may be some gun running involved, um, <laughs> other things. I'm not 100%. I'm not going to tease it out too much. We'll get into all of it next week. Uh, and, you know, until then, you know, John, you guys led the way. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you guys for uh, years later picking up the sword and carrying it forward, man. Thanks for your service, too. It's like the uh, I always like talking to different generations of veterans. It's an honor. It so really do I, John. It's always instructive. Yeah. Um, well, and next time, gentlemen. We'll be talking. Dave, take care. Continue to heal, brother. Thank you. All right. Thank St you. Stick around, John. We're going to do the uh, bonus segment. Thanks, okay. everybody. Oh, whatever you need, let me know. Okay. Okay. We'll see you guys next week.